Welcome everyone. Greetings from Istanbul. As the Center for Upcoming and Malay World Studies, our academic programs on the Malay-Indonesian world are continuing. Today, we have a special guest, a leading research fellow at the Written Heritage Department, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences, Dr. Leibov Goryaeva. Her main research interests are Malay manuscripts, tradition, edition of the Malay fictional hikayat, frame stories, didactics, chronicles, Malay narrative folklore, Muslim education in modern Russia. She translated some of the well-known works in the Malay literature into the Russian language with commentary and analysis. And some of her publications are Hikayat Raja Parsayi in 2015, the story of the kings of Parsayi, Monuments of Malay Book Culture from 15th to 17th century, Hikayat Pandavajaya and Taju Salatino Bukhari al Jawhari in 2011, Hikayat Maharaja Marakarma Mara in 2008, Muslim Education in Modern Russia in 2003, uh, Hikayat Bakhtiar in 1989, and Interrelation of Written and Oral Traditions in the Classical Malay Literature in 1979. Uh, welcome, Dr. Goryaeva. Thank you. It's just an exhaustive presentation I've never heard before. Uh, it's really very nice of you to, to, um, to make such an exposition of my scientific acquisitions. Now at uh, Nusantara Society, because uh, um, it's a long story. Malay language and literature are a relatively new part of Oriental studies in our country. Uh, before October Revolution of 1917, any information about Malay verbal arts were mainly excerpts from Western European sources and scholarly works. Voyages of Russian to Southeast Asia only seldom had any connection with the literary sphere. Admiral Ivan Krusenstern, when calling at Malacca in 1798, ordered a copy of the famous chronicle Sejarah Mulayu, called also Sulalata Salatin. Later, he donated it to the Imperial Academy of Sciences. Bakunin, Russian consul in Batavia, introduced some specimens of pantoon, uh, po uh, popular poetry, in his book Tropical Holland, written in 1902. About a dozen manuscripts were acquired by the Asiatic Museum in St. Petersburg. Now it is the Institute of Oriental Manuscripts of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR. The Russian State Library in Moscow has an interesting collection of printed books in Malay published in the last decade of the 19th, first decades of the 20th centuries. Generally, the source basis of Malay studies in Russia was slight, so that our scholars mostly have to deal with edited texts. Indeed, thanks to generous assistance of their colleagues from abroad, they can gain access to copies of unedited manuscripts too. It was my case. Today, our special thanks not only to them, but to the general process of digitalization of all kinds of texts and pictures related to Nosantar. Many book, research papers, and even manuscripts can be found online. Personally, I find most of the materials I need for my research through the internet. In our country, Malay-Indonesian language studies began after the World War II at the universities of Moscow and Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. At the beginning, we students of the 60s were studying Indonesian, the official language of Indonesian Republic. Later, 
in 1967, the Soviet Union established diplomatic relations with Malaysia. Then the teaching of the Malay language of Malaysia began. In 1970, the first group of Russian students from Moscow University came to Kuala Lumpur to study Malay at University Malaya. Over the years, the practice of student exchanges with Indonesia interrupted in the period after 1965 was also restored. The first Russian explorer of Malay language and literature was Lyudmila Merwar. She graduated as specialist in Western philology, but then she worked as an ethnologist and took part in a scholarly expedition to India, Ceylon, and Burma. In 1927, she studied Malay in France and in the Netherlands. Before World War II, only one article of hers was published in a book about various forms of theater in Nusantara, including Malay Indonesian Wayang. Much later, in 1961, Ludmila Merwet published her translation of the Malay Ramayana, the story of Sri Rama, Hikayat Sri Rama, you can see it here. The original text was Ballet Pustaka edition of 1953. The book has a subtitle, Indonesian Ramayana. The introduction dealt with some differences between the Malay story and the Indian prototype. In 1973, eight years after the death of, of Merver, her disciple, Boris Parnikel, published her translation of the story of Sangboma, Hikayat Sangboma, based on an edition of 1924 with his comments and research articles. In the years that followed, Boris Parnikil became the key figure of Malay-Indonesian studies in USSR and Russia. He studied the Indonesian language at the Moscow Institute of International Relations. Besides translations and reviews of some Malay and Indonesian works, he published a series of articles on the famous Malay epic of the 17th century, Hikayat Hangtuah. He translated not only this Hikayat, but also short stories and folk romances of today. For a certain time, he was a lecturer in Malay uh, literature at Moscow State University. His translation of the history of Malay literature by Richard Winstead, published in Moscow in 1966, was contrary to the saying, the first wallow that made the spring. His book, Introduction to the Literary History of Nusantara of the 9th, 19th centuries, published in 1980, became the first Russian fundamental work on Malay traditional literature. Also, Farnikil most actively promoted the achievements of Soviet and Russian researchers of Nusantara. Little by little, the number of Malay Indonesian, see, we see the second, uh, uh, little by little, the number of Malay Indonesian language learners was growing. There was a need for a forum where colleagues could discuss various issues related to Nusantara studies. understand I, I looked for it somewhere else. Thank you. So in December, the first session of Malay Indonesian readings was held at the Institute of Oriental Languages, Moscow State University. Besides Boris Parinkil himself, it was the initiative of such scholars and university professors as academician Alexander Guber, 
Natalia Aliva and Lilian Sikorsky. Later, in 1990, on the basis of Malay Indonesian readings, the Nusantara Society arose. Nusantara Society is an association of scholars, university teachers, graduate and undergraduate students from Moscow and St. Petersburg, academic and education institutions dealing with studies of Nusantara, a wide region inhabited by people speaking the Austronesian languages, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, Philippines, Madagascar, Oceania, and also to a certain extent, Thailand, Vietnam, and Taiwan. The Nusantara main activities comprise promoting the study of history, philology, economics, and culture of Nusantara, teaching these disciplines in Russia, establishing contacts with foreign research centers and universities, exchange of books, periodicals, and other materials, implementation of joint research projects, organization of conferences and seminars. Its founders was Boris Parnike and Noria Muhammad, professor at University Science Malaysia. Finally, in 1998, the Nusantara Center was created at the Institute of Asian and African Countries, Moscow State University. There is no formal membership in the society. Today, Nusantara Society is run by a president, Vilen Sikorsky, and two vice presidents, Evgenia Kukushkina and Viktor Pogadaev. Since then, regular meetings of researchers of Malay-Indonesian world are held there every month from September to May. The program of each session usually includes two research papers followed by a discussion. You can find here a brief, brief statistical account of our activities during more than half a century. The circle of speakers is very wide, from professors and academicians to university students, guests from Indonesia and Malaysia, who speak about the life on Nusantara today. At this meeting, scholars, postgraduate students, and students from various universities and academic institutions from Moscow and St. Petersburg can meet and share the results of their research in the field of history, culture, literature, arts, and ethnology of Nusantara. All these years long, we published regularly the proceedings of our seminars and conferences. Sometimes it was not easy at all. We had no budget for such editions, but fortunately we could find sponsors to support our publishing activities. And our serial edition Malay-Indonesian studies continued throughout all these years. Many of the members of Nusantara have been translating works of modern Malay and Indonesian authors into Russian. Here you can see the titles of some of them and the number of copies. It's really a pity that today in Russia, as Elsewhere, I think, people read less and therefore publish less. But the, as it may, we can continue our translation activities. Even in the field of so-called traditional literature, their target audience is much narrower, but these publications are absolutely necessary for those who are interested in the culture of Nusantara, but do not speak Malay. The vice president of Nusantara Society, Viktor Pogadaev, not only translated many works of Malay in the Indonesian prose and poetry, but also introduced the Nusantara reading public to selected Russian classics in his own translations. You, you may see them below. 
He is really an ambassador of Russian culture in Malaysia and Indonesia. They are also members of Nusantara Society outside Moscow in St. Petersburg. First of all, those who are working in the oldest research center in Russia, the Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography, called also Kunstkamera, founded in St. Petersburg in 1714 by Peter the Great. Unique collections are kept there, including those from the region of insular Southeast Asia. On the initiative of our colleagues from the Kunstkamera, an international event, the, inter the annual forum called the Maclay Readings is taking place there. It deals with problems of ethnographic fieldwork in Nusantara, Australia, and Oceania. Some members of Nusantara live in Nusantara. The first to mention is the historian Professor Tatiana Denisova, who lives in Kuala Lumpur and works at the University of Technology Malaysia, and at the same time at the Institute of Oriental Studies in Moscow. You may see here two books published in uh, Kuala Lumpur and two others published in Russian in Moscow. Last month, an international workshop of Nusantara Society was held in Moscow via Zoom, of course. It was dedicated to the 65th anniversary of the Institute of Asian and African Studies, Moscow State University, where the headquarters of Nusantara Society are located. Its program comprised a wide range of issues related to linguistics, history, literature, folklore, economics, and politics of Nusantara countries. Among the speakers, in addition to those from Russia, there were scholars from Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia. As I told you before, there is no formal membership at Nusantara Society. But once people come for the first time to attend our session, they always return later, on and on. A large part of our audience is young. At first, they just come to listen. And later, some of them, if not, if not all of them, take heart to speak and present their own papers. I am convinced that Nusantara Society has a happy future ahead. So welcome to our meetings, colleagues, and thank you. Thank you so much for this, I mean, really brief, I mean, good uh, presentation, Dr. Gorilla, about the Nusantara Society. It is the first time, I guess, the, uh, uh, the professors and researchers in the field and also in the people in Turkey are uh, he hearing about the Nusantara Society first time. Thank you so much. And I have some questions, uh, no. of course, and our audience can also ask their questions if they have in the comment section on YouTube. So we can pose these questions to Dr. Goriaeva. Uh, so far as I understood from your presentation, the Malay studies in Russia actually began in late 19th century, right? Uh, you know that Malay and Indonesian, at least in the field of language, it was just the same thing up to the, at least uh, up to the middle of the, 19th century, if not later. So the, when we speak of traditional literature, literature, nobody says there was a traditional Indonesian literature, only traditional Malay literature. But then they parted and there was a difference. Now there is a difference between the two languages, but not, not crucial, not yes. radical. Uh, that's why uh, when the Malay studies began, when I speak about this group of students from uh, Moscow who went to Kuala Lumpur in 1970, uh, all of them 
um, studied uh, at the, in the group of Indonesian language, but they understood everything they could speak. And so there were some little details uh, easily manageable uh, in the contacts. So they became two of them, Pogadai that I mentioned and the other uh, who is no more, unfortunately, Tatiana Grafieva. They were among the first to make the Malay Russian uh, dictionary based on Kamus the One, published academic edition, published in Kuala Lumpur, and did a lot of things to promote the, uh, the Ma Malaysian Malay and not Indonesian. Indonesian. So up to now in Moscow University, there are, at the Moscow University, there are um, years when uh, uh, the Institute of uh, Asian and Africa countries accept a group uh, of students for Indonesian studies. And next year, for, for instance, for the Malay sites, in such a way, still as for the, for, uh, for the literature, the traditional literature. It's just the same story because in Indonesia, they have also the Javanese language and the Javanese uh, literature not less rich than Malay literature. So it's very de delicate subject. Nevertheless, uh, we, have, uh, um, we have two languages uh, under the roof of uh, the two languages uh, under the roof of Nusantara, together with the languages of the Philippines and so on. So do you have any original manuscripts from the Malay literature, original ones? Uh, okay, you know, uh, there, are no, there are no persons, personality who have original uh, manuscripts. Still, we have 11 original manuscripts in St. Petersburg. Uh, at, the, at the library of the Institute of Oriental Manuscripts, who deals, uh, this institute deals mainly with uh, editing, translating, publishing uh, Oriental Manuscripts. And there was a very interesting story because at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, there was a collection of manuscripts who finally came to St. Petersburg uh, via seven, uh, some persons. And the way it went from the uh, sources up to the library is not very clear, not, not very clear. But still, um, we have a collection of manuscripts. Um, most of them belong to the famous Lenin Library in Jakarta. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the family of, uh, of the man called Muhammad Bakir. It was the lending library where the scribes, generation after generation, worked on copying manuscripts of traditional literature, son after father, and so on. And uh, it, uh, it was a moment, I think, at the end of the 19th century when uh, their business didn't go as good as they would like to see it. So they sold a, a certain quantity of it here and there, and some of the manuscripts finally came to St. Petersburg. One, for instance, there was the oldest manuscript um, of, the, of this collection, uh, Hikayat Maharaja Marakarma, and I have the chance to uh, see it, to make a transcription into Latin characters and to edit it in form of first uh, a CD with the original text in color and everything, then transcription with Latin characters and finally Russian translation with the research articles. It was the way to, the way to edit them. I think it's, it's, it was a good idea. And I haven't heard after that, that was any, there was any practice of such an editing, be it in Russia or elsewhere. So, and after that, there was one 
very interesting thing here too, because there were two manuscripts which uh, were copies of the first of all the one. So it would be very interesting if I have time and the opportunity to compare. For me, academically, it's a very interesting subject. What changes the scribe made to the text he has under his eyes? So one generation of changes, you understand? It's very interesting. What really they, because we know that they change words, um, that mix some passages and everything. But here, it's really, a, there is really a proof that there are uh, two, these manuscripts are like father and sons. So, uh, and uh, um, among the editions of traditional texts that I mentioned here before, it was the manuscript of Sulalata Salatin, or Sajarak Mulayu, the most famous Malay chronicle, which was uh, brought by Kruzenstein, I also mentioned, uh, an officer of marine, uh, uh, he made full of research during his voyages. And uh, he also brought a manuscript of uh, Sulalata Salatin to St. Petersburg. So uh, you see that some of the text, uh, step by step, quite slowly, but they have no specialist in Malay tradition at this Institute of uh, Oriental Manuscripts. That's why it doesn't go that, uh, that quickly. Uh, still, uh, things are moving, uh, are moving uh, in such a way that we may hope, perhaps, if there are people eager to work on manuscripts, they will find interesting things in the St. Petersburg collection. Thank you so much. I also wonder, I mean, your story, I mean, how did you start? I mean, how your interest in the Nutsantara region, I mean, has begun? I mean, how did you learn the language? Because you're making translations. I mean, yes. and Nutsantara society is, I mean, as few members, I mean, not a broad, I mean, there is no broad interest in academic world as well. In Russia in and elsewhere, but how did you, I mean, how did your interest begin, begin in this field? You know, it was the choice. Uh, I wanted to study at the, uh, at the Institute of Oriental Languages when uh, I was 17. And I had to, do, to make a choice of language because if I, uh, at the uh, exam of entrance, I had good notes, I could choose the language. There was no, one another factor. It was the basic, uh, the basic uh, European language the future student knew. I knew French and uh, a little bit of uh, uh, English, but as I had good notes, I had the choice. And I asked for advice. Uh, my uh, elder brother, he is my half brother, much older than me, who worked there. And he said, you choose Indonesia because there are plenty of things to do, plenty of material for research. And I agreed, and I think it's really wonderful. I like uh, Indonesia because it's multicultural. I like it because it's because of that it's very open. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that uh, in some way the mono ethnicity, ethnicity is something very dangerous for for a country. It often is. So here we have really a choice of cultures, of languages, of traditions, and all of them living together without quarrels, or let's say almost without quarrels, but still they are together. And that's why the, as such a country as Indonesia is, uh, 
uh, is really an example for many of us, many of those who have many peoples, many different uh, ethnies in, 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 the, in their state. Differences together in an harmony. So yes. Yes, understand. So how do you see the new generation in Russia? Actually, you shared a picture photograph with us, with the, some young researchers. Are they interested in Indonesian and Malay languages and the Nusantara studies as well? How do yes, you uh, yes, of course. But you know, now they, they have more opportunities uh, for working in these countries, in the economic field, uh, uh, in uh, or something, not only in diplomacy, but still there are many, many contacts, many opportunities for studying there many opportunities for beginning some new initiatives. So I think that uh, there are lots of them, but I am um, afraid uh, they are not as uh, um, uh, very motivated to learn traditional culture, traditional literature, and perhaps the, to go into the depth of history, and so when I uh, I was uh, a kind of uh, a kind of teacher for the students of uh, uh, second and third year at the um, at this institute, and uh, I read uh, to them and presented them a course of traditional Malay literature. I said always said to them, first of all, I teach you to translate quickly the text that you see. It may be original text, quite old, but if you have this habit, you'll be a success with later, with everything, because you know this text, you know the heritage of this country, and you have the... Uh, mm, the men, uh, they, uh, you have elaborated a spontaneous approach to the phrase because at the beginning they said, oh, I have the, to read the whole phrase there and perhaps two to translate. I said, no, you just see the, the phrase and you begin. So it was interesting because at the same time we studied parts of traditional text and I chose the most uh, interesting, the, the most um, nice ones, so they could admire and uh, feel the flavor of this culture, of this literature, and not just uh, uh, quite formal things that one can find in the, uh, in the books for university students, just facts and so on. So if they are interested in Nusantara's uh, studies, I mean, firstly, they have a language study, right? I mean, for preparation. So they have also such opportunities. I mean, if they would like to study Indonesian or Malay language, so they can have it, right? Yes, uh, at the Nusantara Society, there are no studies. We have conferences, mm -hmm. we have That's seminars, so with discussions and everything still. Uh, we presume that people know some of the language, some of the culture, uh, because often they are uh, first or second year students to, co to come to assist to our seminars. So you, when I speak, I try to make it more simple, more accessible to them. But still, uh, I want them to see how this is made the text, an event, uh, and uh, things like that. Understand, understand, Professor. And thank you so much for your presentation. If you would like to add something, I mean, about the Nusantara society or the Malay studies in general in Russia, because this was really, I mean, maybe brief presentation, but it was really interesting because we were not familiar with the Malay and Indonesian studies in Russia, and it was a really good introduction. Thank you so much for this.
So uh, I thank you too. I, it was a good opportunity. Excuse me, excuse me for my not <laughs> mastering no, the, no the presentation. Still, I, I'd like to to, to say that uh, such a culture, such a culture, not very similar, not similar at all to Russian culture. Any sure. culture which is different from our, our culture is something that enrich your vision of the world, your vision of your country, of your culture, of your language, of your literature and folklore. And finally, when you study another, another language, another culture, you begin to, to love it. People who know foreign language, they cannot uh, hate people who are people maybe speaking these languages. That is my point of view. Thank you so much. It was a really good motivation as well for the new researchers if they are interested in Malay Indonesian studies. So they will see that even in Russia, there are some really, I mean, motivated professors like you, yes. like the Center of Society members. And I mean, it will be a good motivation for them as well. I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Yes. Goodbye.